In this presentation, we're going to look at the structure and function of carbohydrates. In a previous presentation about proteins, we looked at the dehydration synthesis reactions for assembling macromolecules and hydrolysis for breaking them apart. These same reactions play a part in assembly of carbohydrate polymers. Carbohydrates are a diverse class of molecules that have a chemical formula of CH2 O n times. One of the challenging aspects of learning about carbohydrates is learning how they're named and getting a hold of their diversity. Now, for my class, I'd like you to have a feeling for how they are diverse, but you don't need to know all the details of their naming. One of the first ways in which carbohydrates can vary is the number of carbon atoms in the backbone. On the left, there's a triose with three carbon atoms, and on the right, there's a hexose with six carbons. Another way carbohydrates can vary is the position of the double bonded oxygen atom, or the carbonyl group. In aldoses, the carbonyl group is at the end of the carbon chain, whereas in ketoses, the carbonyl group is in the middle of the carbon chain. One of the very difficult things about carbohydrates is that several of their carbon atoms are chiral. This means that the particular spatial arrangements around each chiral atom makes a difference to the molecular structure. For example, on the left there's glucose and on the right lactose. The only difference between them is the arrangement of groups around the number four carbon. Let's look a little bit more deeply at how that works. Let's start by looking at a very simple carbohydrate with only one chiral carbon atom. Remember that the central carbon is chiral because it has four different groups attached to it. Imagine orienting it so that your eyes are where the flashlight is. The carbonyl group, CHO, would be at the top and the terminal carbon would be at the bottom. The H and OH groups would be at the side and, very importantly, they would be coming out of the paper towards you. This diagram shows a, how a Fisher projection is drawn using this orientation. With this projection, the orientation is always the same. With the carbonyl group at the top of the paper, the carbon atoms along the chain are where the lines cross, and the horizontal lines are always coming out of the paper towards you. In the example here, you can see that four groups are arranged differently around the chiral carbon atom. Here's another example with a four carbon molecule. Again, the carbonyl group is at the top of the page and the horizontal lines represent groups that are coming out of the page towards your eye. I want to draw your attention to the last chiral carbon atom in the chain. This chiral carbon atom is important for naming the sugar. When we look at the Fisher projection like this, we see that the OH group is on the right of the last chiral carbon. This means that it is a D, or dextrorotatory, sugar. If the OH group were on the left, it would be levorotatory and would be called an L sugar. Nature, for whatever reason, only uses D sugars. Just for practice, let's look at one more sugar. Again, we put the carbonyl group at the top of the page and rotate it backwards into the paper or screen. Each of the horizontal groups is coming out of the paper toward the eye. Look for the last chiral carbon here and determine if it's an L or D sugar. You should be able to identify the marked carbon atom as the last, as, as the last carbon. Notice that it is not the next carbon down the chain. That carbon has two hydrogen atoms attached and is therefore not chiral. This is another D sugar because the OH group is on the right. One of the features of monosaccharides is that when they're in aqueous solution, they form ring structures. To see how this works, let's look at these two structures, which are actually the same. To see that, let's take the structure on the left and lay it on its, lay it on its edge, remembering the orientation of the H and OH groups around the chiral carbons. Here, we've done just that. The original molecule is now on its side. 
you can see how the numbered carbon atoms coincide with the carbon atoms in the diagram above. In the upper diagram, the carbon backbone is arranged in, almost in a circle, sitting, sitting on the table in front of you. The thick bonds connecting carbon atoms indicate that those are closer to your eye than the thin ones, such as between carbons 5 and 6. So after you lay down your Fisher projection on its side, wrap it around the back. Finally, a rotation around the bond between number 4 and 5 should put carbon number 6 above the ring. In the middle structure here, the last carbon has moved above the level of the ring. This puts the OH group of the, five car of the fifth carbon in a position so that it can react with the carbonyl group at carbon number one. Closing the ring through the oxygen atom causes the number one carbon to now become chiral. If the OH group is on top, above the level of the ring, then we designate that to be a beta conformation. If the ring closed with the OH group below the level of the ring, then this is what we call an alpha conformation. Now, the nomenclature for why this is true is very tricky, and for the purposes of our course, just remember that if you orient the number six carbon above the level of the ring, then the OH group on carbon number one is beta when it's above the ring and alpha when it's below the ring. Notice that all of these reactions are reversible. This means that the closed ring can open. The atoms can spin around on the single bonds and it can reclose. This means that in a solution, there will always be a mixture of the alpha and beta conformations, although the exact proportion depends on their relative stability. In general, the ring formation is much more stable than the linear formation, and so at any given time, most molecules exist as rings. When monosaccharides polymerize, they form polysaccharides through the formation of glycosidic bonds. As with other dehydration synthesis reactions, we get a molecule of water that is released from the bonding atoms. Let's look at these molecules carefully. Each of them is an alpha glucose. We know this because if we put the number six carbon above the level of the ring, the OH group from the number one carbon is below the ring. When these two alpha glucose molecules bond in this way, they form an alpha glycosidic linkage. Now, how does the glycosidic bond form if we have a beta sugar? Well, in order for the reactive groups to come in contact with each other, the second glucose molecule needs to be, needs to be flipped over relative to the first. This is called a beta glycosidic linkage. In particular, Notice that the number one carbon is linked through the glycosidic linkage to the number four carbon. We can therefore specify that this is a beta 1,4 glycosidic linkage. Although the difference between alpha and beta glycosidic linkages may not at first seem important, biologically they are very different. The bond angles that form from an alpha glycosidic linkage cause a long polymer of starch to form in a helical structure. This helical structure prevents close association of other polymers. In addition to the 1,4 glycosidic bonds, glucose subunits can also form 1,6 glycosidic bonds connecting the number 1 and number 6 carbons. Being able to form both of these bonds allows the polymer to be branched. Polysaccharides that store energy in the form of starch, such as that stored by many plants, is a branched polysaccharide with alpha-1,6 and alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds. Glycogen, which is used as short-term energy storage in animals, is much more branched than starch. A really interesting thing happens in the case of beta-glycosidic bonds. Because each successive beta-glucose monomer is flipped over relative to the previous one, the end result is the polymer is much flatter than a polymer of starch, which, remember, had a spiral shape. 
As a result of this flat, linear structure, multiple polymers can lie side by side with each other. When they do this, hydrogen bonds form between the OH groups. The result of this regular and frequent hydrogen bonding is that the resulting cellulose is incredibly strong and stable. Cellulose is one of the most important cellular macromolecules that largely give plants their shape and ability to grow tall against gravity. We humans don't have enzymes to break down glycosidic bonds, sorry, beta-glycosidic bonds. Instead, when we eat plant material, we rely on bacteria in our gut to help us digest those beta-glycosidic bonds. Fungi and insects make use of beta-glycosidic bonds, except their glucose molecules have been modified. As with cellulose, extensive hydrogen bonding exists between the relatively flat, straight polymers. Bacteria have a layer in their cell walls called peptidoglycan. These modified glucose molecules again interact with each other to form a very stable, strong lattice. In the case of peptidoglycan, the side chains are actually amino acids, which can form strong peptide bonds with other amino acids on adjacent polysaccharide chains. Perhaps the main use of carbohydrates is that they are a form of energy storage. When plants photosynthesize, they produce carbohydrates, which are rapidly turned into glucose subunits. These glucose molecules can be used by the plants directly to provide energy for cellular activities, or they can be linked together and the energy stored, as in the starch of a potato. Although animals don't have starch, we link glucose subunits together into glycogen, which is similar in function to starch. Moreover, as we'll see later, if uh, all, all organisms use glucose and other carbohydrates as an energy source for their cells. As we've already seen, carbohydrates provide structural support. Polysaccharides are cross-linked together to form cellulose in plants, chitin in insects, and peptidoglycan in bacterial cell walls. The last main function that we haven't talked about yet is the use of carbohydrates in cell recognition and identity. Proteins that exist on the cell membrane have carbohydrates attached to them. Usually, we refer to these as oligosaccharides because they have several, but not many, sugar subunits. The exact identity of the oligosaccharides is individual or cell-specific. This allows cells to recognize each other's surface and is a primary mechanism for the immune system to identify cells that are part of our body from cells that are foreign, from the outside.